Good evening and welcome to the Word and Sword broadcast. I'm Stan Adams. Uh, we want you to know that you are a welcome guest. We want you to get comfortable and be ready to uh, enter into a study of God's Word. For those of you that may be listening out of town, we come to you through WHKY, which is uh, based in Hickory, North Carolina. And we do get out to several different areas and uh, we are glad again that you have tuned in. You are a vital part of this program and your calls do matter. We'd like to bring your attention now to uh, where we meet. We are at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And our regular assembly times are Bible study at 9.30 and our worship at 11. And then Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And we would certainly enjoy you coming to be with us and invite you to do that. The Word and Sword again is brought to you by the members of the Newton Church. You can contact us uh, by going on, on email to contact at wordandsword.com. Also by phone here at the building, 828-465-3009, or by snail mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And our website again is www.wordandsword.com. So again, if you would like to do that, we would uh, certainly uh, welcome you to do that. Now, if you would, we would like to draw your attention at this point, our guest speaker this evening, Daniel King, Sr. Thank you so much, Stan. Let me begin that what we're actually going to talk about today is the subject of God's existence. As you know, a lot of college professors and school teachers and others are very skeptical to the notion of whether God exists or not. And so we're talking here about a topic and about a subject that for a lot of people is just beside the point. In, in other words, whatever you talk about in regard to what the Bible teaches or what the Bible says on a given thing is kind of outside the purview of what they're concerned with. They just don't care. And the reason they don't care is because they do not believe that God exists at all. And so what we plan to do in the next couple of hours in our time together is we're going to talk about some of the logical and consequential arguments that can be made that say that God does actually exist. Now why is that important? Well not just because of the fact that that the Bible says this or that, but on account of the fact that your life has to be conducted in certain ways if the answer is no, and has to be conducted in other ways if the answer is yes. And so what we're talking about is something that is very consequential, ultimately. Is it worthwhile knowing whether God exists at all? And the answer is it's very worthwhile to know, and it's very important to know. Let me, let me begin with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. There the Bible says, in the beginning God. In the beginning God. Now, as far as some people would be concerned, the very statement that in the beginning God is as far as they're concerned, kind of beyond the realm. And the reason they would say so is because there needs to be some sort of support to the fact or the statement of fact that God exists. And the result of that is that they just sort of bracket those kinds of points out because as far as they're concerned, the writer of the book of Genesis doesn't make a logical argument or presentation of an argument that says that here is why we believe that God exists. And so the time we're going to spend together is going to present some arguments to the effect that God does exist. Let me begin along that line with a thought from Romans chapter 1 verse 19. Here Paul says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Now let's begin by understanding that as far as Paul is concerned, that God has spoken very plainly. That he has spoken of his own existence very plainly. And that there's no mistaking what he has said. 
He said, what can be known about God is plain to them. Plain to who? It's plain to people who deny that he exists, in spite of the fact that they deny that he exists. He said, because God has shown it to them. In other words, in spite of the fact that they deny the claim that God exists, God has given plenty of evidence to the effect that he does, in spite of all their arguments to the contrary. So let's go on. Verse 20, Romans chapter 1. He said, for his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Who are they? Well, they, of course, are those who deny him. He said, so that they are without excuse. He said the evidence is perceptible. The evidence is real. The evidence is plentiful. The evidence is abundant. So much so, he says, that they are without excuse. There is no excusing what they believe. Their denial of God. Now, of course, Paul immediately had in his mind, those who were idolaters in their denial of the true and the real God. But that, of course, is effectively uh, applicable to everyone who is in that category of non-believers in one respect or another. Whether they are pagans and therefore non-believers, or they are agnostics and therefore non-believers, or whether they are outright atheists and non-believers, it matters not. The fact of the matter is the evidence is there. It is there for them. It is plain for them to see. And it's a question merely of whether they will accept what is so very evident according to what Paul says. A couple of observations here. Number one, God is invisible and therefore God is unprovable in the physical world by its normal modes of proof, proof or proving. In other words, for example, you could not deny that I exist because I'm sitting here and you see me and you could come up and you could touch me and you would say, that guy exists. You could never deny that I exist because of all the physical modes of attribution of existence would be simple. There he sits. There he is. Therefore he exists. But God is not provable by those same modes of testing. And so he's different in that way. But notice it says in the text that the things that are made give undeniable evidence of his reality. We just read that. He said so much so that they are without excuse. There is so much evidence, it's so plentiful, that they have no excuse. You could imagine them standing before God in the final day. And they say, I lived all my life, God, not believing that you exist at all. And God will say, you have no excuse. You have no excuse at all for believing what you do and what you did. Here I am now, but throughout the years of your existence, you denied my existence in spite of all the evidence that I left for myself in every very, the expressions, if you will, uh, or manifestations of my existence in nature, all about you, those things are there. And so the point is that unbelievers have absolutely no basis upon which to sustain their negative case. Their negative case is this, God does not exist. Now I want you to suppose for a moment that here have a, you have a lady here, she calls the police department. She said, I hear a sound in my, in my house. I think somebody's in my house. 
And so the 911 caller says, we'll, we'll send a police officer, a cruiser, immediately to help you. But it's going to take a few moments for the cruiser to get there. So answer a few questions for me. Um, why is it that you, you think somebody's in your house? I hear something. I've heard it repeatedly. I've heard a sound. Well, are you telling me there is somebody in your house or they're not? No, I don't think there is. I, I, I'm not positive whether there is or not. I'm not sure. As a matter of fact, I went throughout the house and I looked here and I looked there. And I looked at the other place and I did not see anyone in the house. And so on the one hand, I believe that there's no one in the house. And yet I hear this sound and I've heard it repeatedly and I believe someone is in the house. And so the questioner continues. She says, are there any beds in the house under which there might, let's say, be a man hiding? Could there be a man hiding under the bed somewhere? And she answers, well, I thought I looked at under all of them, but Perhaps it's possible that under one of the beds, there's someone hiding. Well, is there, a, is there a closet somewhere that you have not inspected? I thought I looked at all of the closets. I thought that there, that, that there couldn't be anyone in the house because I thought I looked at every single closet. Is there one closet in the house that you might not have looked into? Well, I can't think of one. And the point is, can she answer definitively that there is no one in her house? This is a little bit like the agnostic or the atheist. He said, God, God does not exist. Why? I've never seen him. Have you looked at every corner of the universe? Have you inspected every nook and every cranny of the material universe? Can you really tell us that you know God is nowhere about because you've not found him, you've not physically seen him, you've not put your hands on him, you've not touched him, he's not talked to you and you've not heard him? Is that what you're saying? You see what we're saying? The moment that you say God does not exist, you're saying I know every nook and every cranny of the physical universe. I've seen it all. I know about it all. Well, that's a rather large claim, isn't it? And that's not even including the metaphysical. And by the metaphysical, I mean that which is beyond the physical. Well, of course, there are those who say there is no such thing as anything that's beyond the physical. Well, but what if there is? It's like the lady who says, there's no one in my house. But it sounds like there's someone in my house. Have you looked at every nook and every cranny of the house? He could be there. And the point is with regard to God, God could be in the very place and at the very time that you say he does not exist. He might very well be there where you cannot find him and cannot see him. In the beginning, God, the author says in Genesis. Let me... Let me pause to look at another scripture. In the book of Psalms, chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Notice what he called the person who says there is no God. He said, this person is a fool. Now in our time, most of those who claim God does not exist have an air of authority about themselves. Not only so, but an air of superiority about themselves. I authoritatively say that God is not possible. There is no such thing as God, and I do not believe that God is possible. Again, are you sure that there's not some nook or cranny of the universe where he is, where you've not seen him, you've not experienced him? The fool, he says, says there is no God. Are you positive there is no metaphysical realm where he is? A realm beyond this physical realm where he is. But the writer goes on to explain thus. He says, they 
are corrupt. We're in Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. Oh, sometimes people have high-sounding claims that they make about their own beliefs about social justice and, and, and all such things. They want societal justice. They want almost a communistic notion of equality, total equality in society. And, and in the sense of, of totally equivalent returns so that everyone, no matter what their ability, no matter what their, the, the point is everybody gets the same thing. It's like the government cuts us all a check and it's for the same amount. Well, the idea is social justice, and that's what they deem to be their reason for existing. That sort of thinking. Listen to what the author says. They are corrupt. Somebody says, oh, that's not so. That, surely, here's this person with these high-sounding elitist philosophies, and it sounds like they just love everybody and they want good in everybody. We'll go back and examine communism as it developed in the old Soviet Union and how e equivalency of outcome became ultimately, if you were a part of the, the elite, the communist elite, members of the party as they called it, they ended up with all the stuff and the common man became a peasant and a serf. And the point is, they were corrupt. In the end, even though they believe these high sounding notions about social justice, ultimately, they were corrupt and they did abominable deeds. In fact, millions of people were slaughtered under their thumb. They were corrupt. The psalmist is right. No matter what people claim, no matter what they say, it is the fool who says there is no God. Now why am I picking on communism? Anyone knows the history of communism will be aware that the communists were atheists. They were all atheists. And they forced people under their thumb to be atheists too. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good, says the psalmist. And he's right. He's dead right. But then verse 2 of the text says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of man to see if there is any or there are any who understand and who seek after God. And he explains, They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Many of these folks in our own time who claim to be atheists or agnostics are people who have moral problems. They have sexual issues and they want to do what they want to do. They, God is most inconvenient and inconvenient for them. God's laws and how they should conduct their lives are problems for them. They don't want any part of that sort of stuff. So in fact, the psalmist has his finger upon the pulse of these people. He understands perfectly how their minds work. Their minds are corrupt. There is none that does good, not even one, he explains. We need to understand that concept. It's very key. The people who seem to be so principled in many instances are not principled people at all. They are corrupt people, in fact. The best people you'll know are the people who submit themselves to God. The best people you'll know are people who are believers in God. Oh, they make mistakes, but they admit that they make mistakes. They're sinners, but they admit that they're sinners. Others have these high-sounding claims and look down upon those of us who are just plain sinners saved by grace, make fun of us and think we're all idiots. But we're not. We have, in many instances, intellectual reasons for believing that God exists. 
in Psalm 19, in a very simple passage, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. If you could imagine an ancient figure walking outdoors on a cold, dark evening, looking up into the heavens or up into the night sky, spread out before him are the hundreds of thousands of points of light above. And many of those we now know because of the Hubble telescope, those simple points of light re represent not just a single sun as large as our own sun, but galaxies of suns as large as our own sun. That's God's handiwork. The psalmist in the long ago looked up and saw that. And in his simplicity, today, we have telescopes and, and, and giant uh, uh, astronomical laboratories that examine the heavens and see what is above. And people are, are awestruck when they see what there is in the night sky. Listen again. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Two words, speech and knowledge. Speech and knowledge. The worst first one is speech. Someone looks up and says, I don't hear a thing. But this author says, I hear everything. I hear everything. They're telling me that God made them in their majesty and in their glory. They tell me that God made them. And I'll tell you, the simple folk of earth have always maintained such. It is the so-called academic, the pointed-headed elitist who says, I don't see a thing up there. I don't hear anything. But this ancient writer said, I see everything. And I hear it all. Night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, he says. There are no words whose voice is not heard, he explains. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Someone says, that's a contradiction. <laughs> that's not a contradiction. They're, they're both truisms. On the one hand, if you, if you put a microphone to it all, you wouldn't hear a thing. It'd be totally quiet. But if you look up and you listen with a listening ear, you would hear it all. They are crying out about the glory of God and the majesty of that one who made them come to be. Their voice grows out through all the earth, he says and their words to the end of the world. He's convinced, isn't he? The heavens declare, he says, the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. There is the evidence. There is the starting point for everyone. It all begins right there. Don't mistake it. Someone has said that the scientist, when he looks at all of this, at first, just on the surface with a shallow look, he may turn into an atheist. In fact, Francis Bacon long ago put it this way. He said, the first gulp from the glass of the natural sciences will turn you into an atheist, but at the bottom of the glass, God is there waiting for you. The more deeply you look, the more closely you examine, the more you recognize that God is there. There is plenty of evidence of him. Now, when we talk about then the fact that they are without excuse, again, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, they are without excuse, he says. There are lots of arguments that can be made to the effect that God is there, that God made it all, that it all exists because of his wisdom and his knowledge, his ability and his power. 
Now, he's the one who did all this. Then in examining all that, there are several arguments that can be made both positively and negatively in regard to God. Now, I'm not a philosopher. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm not a logician. And it's philosophers and it's logicians who are best suited to deal with the academic arguments that we're going to be talking about in the next few 30-minute periods. Uh, and I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a logician, again. I'm a preacher, so I'm not really fully qualified to frame all these arguments, in, in, except in a, a rather general outline form, and that's what I intend to do. But understand, these arguments are the sum and substance of what we sometimes call apologetics or Christian evidences. And so I'm going to set forth to you some arguments in that regard. Peter said, that we always need to be prepared to make a defense of our faith. And here's how he put it, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that's in you, yet he said do it with gentleness and meekness. We'll try to do just that. We'll try to gently and reverently make a defense to anyone who calls us to account on this point. The point is that there are some very strong, very academic voices that have been raised in recent years. Many of them philosophers, some of them logicians, that is, people who deal in logic. And so occasionally over the course of what we're going to talk about the rest of our two hours together, are going to be using some terminology, some ideas that maybe you're not familiar with, and I'll try my best to take a moment in each instance to describe and use some of these terms in a way so that you'll be able to understand what we're talking about. But they are academic terms. Please understand, they're the specialized terminology of uh, that particular area of expertise. Have you ever been to, in to see your doctor? Your doctor used some word that you puzzled over? Not surprising because he's an expert, isn't he? He's an expert in a particular area of study. And in this case, it's the anatomy of the body. It's in things like pharmacology. It's in, in things like how the body functions and how it works together, sometimes the workings of hormones and other, other chemicals, biochemical relations that, that occur in the body. And so it's a specialized area of expertise. It has its own language, doesn't it? And so does this. But what we're trying to do is learn to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is within you yet doing so with a certain amount of gentleness and reverence. That's what we're going to try to do today, is be gentle and be reverent at the same time understand that we need to make that defense. Is the physical world all there is? That's the ultimate question, isn't it? That's what we're going to talk about as we get together in just a few moments. Or, or does the physical universe have a creator? That's our question. Pause for a few moments and we'll come back here and talk about that then. Thank you. We're talking about God's existence. Is the physical world all there is? Or does the physical universe have a creator? That's the question. And so we want to explore these questions by looking at what we would call the formal arguments that are set forth by philosophers and logicians who explore these answers today. That's what we're going to try to do. And as I mentioned to you, these are specialized areas of expertise. At the same time, you will recognize that there are some philosophers who are atheists and there are some philosophers who are believers. And at the same time, there are some logicians who are atheists or agnostics, and then there are some who are believers. And so the point is there are believers on both sides 
of these areas of expertise, and it must never be minimized. The arguments are very strong, I believe, on the side of the case that God exists. At the same time, since I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a, a logician, I can promise you that our approach here is going to be very basic and not very complicated. At the same time, I want you to recognize that there are many more arguments than I have the time to discuss. There are many more. Due to the nature of the discussion, we have to utilize the language of those areas. Now, what is an argument in the first place? An argument is a series of statements or premises that logically lead to some sort of a conclusion. Anytime you make any argument about anything, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a series of statements or premises that logically lead to some sort of a conclusion. Sometimes we state those as what we call syllogisms. The word syllogism, I understand, is a, is a specialized term of logic. But a syllogism has a major premise, it has a minor premise, at least one major and at least one minor, it can have several, and it has at least one conclusion. It may have several also. But the point is, that's essentially what a syllogism is. It's a series of statements or premises that logically lead to a conclusion. So that's what we're talking about. And a valid argument has to obey the laws or rules, if you will, of logic. Its conclusion must follow from the premises that have been set forth in the earlier part of the argument. The premises need to be true. They can't be false. They have to be supported by the evidence that it's available. At the same time, you need to understand that they can't be what you would call guaranteed to be true. They just have to be more plausible than their opposite. It's the more plausible thing that wins the argument, that carries the day, so to speak, in those situations. So that sometimes a statement or a logical argument may not satisfy everybody. And so we may make one argument and you say, well, that doesn't satisfy me. So let me just put it this way. It is the cumulative effect of all of these arguments, all of them put together, that really has the force of saying to you, God exists. And so when I make one argument, don't just say, well, that doesn't satisfy me, and so that's that. Let me tell you what these arguments are, and, and they are several. The so-called contingency argument, the cosmological arguments, they are five in number. The ontological argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, the intelligence argument, the consciousness argument, the existence of evil argument, and the hiddenness of God argument. These are all arguments either for or against the existence of God. We may not have time to talk about all of them, but it's important that we understand these are all the cumulative arguments that lead us to the conclusion that God is the one who exists in the face of all this. Now, understand the existence of evil is usually said to be an argument against God. I maintain it is an argument for God. In addition, the hiddenness of God to a lot of people, that, well, that's evidence that God does not exist. And I would argue that that argument can be turned on its head. That argument, in fact, is not an argument against God. It is a, an argument for him. So maybe we'll get time to talk about that part. Well, let's begin with what they call the contingency argument. Wilhelm Leibniz, a German, said simply this. Why is there something rather than nothing? This is a beautiful observation, ladies and gentlemen. Aristotle called it the most basic question of all. He further said, it is at the root of all philosophy. And he was right. Think about it for a moment. Look around yourself. Not only is there something, there's a lot of stuff. 
There's a lot all around you. And as a matter of fact, look in the mirror, because you're a part of it all, aren't you? But why is there something? And why is there not nothing? That's what Aristotle called the most basic question of all. Now, why is that important? Because there's another observation that we all make, we all recognize, and that is, from nothing, nothing comes. Let's just say for a moment that, that we were to take a, a vacuum tube and we were to draw out all the molecules of any sort of gas like oxygen or nitrogen or hydrogen or any of those things. All of the oxygen, all of the hydrogen, all of the nitrogen has now been drawn out of this vacuum tube. Now wait one year. There's nothing in it. Wait two years, nothing. Wait five, nothing. Wait a hundred, nothing. Wait a thousand, still nothing. Wait a million, if that were possible, still nothing, right? And it would be universally agreed upon that that's exactly what would be the case. Now, on the other hand, let's say we waited one year and we tested the vacuum tube and there were molecules inside of it. Let me tell you what the scientist would say. He would always observe, why, there's been a breach in the vacuum tube. It's leaked. In other words, molecules have leaked to the inside from the outside. In other words, it would never even possibly enter the mind of the scientist to say, molecules just popped into existence inside that vacuum tube. No one would ever set forth a theory like that. Now you say, what are you trying to say? What are, you, what are you arguing here? Don't you understand that the atheistic scientist argues that the universe at the so-called Big Bang exploded out of nothingness and that from nothing everything became. Everything that now exists, exists out of nothingness. As it were, you have a vacuum tube with nothing in it. Suddenly there are all sorts of molecules in it. And the fellow says, well, they just all popped into existence. Strange theory indeed. We'll talk more about that as we proceed. Now think about the argument as we might state it. The universe exists, doesn't it? We know it does because we're a part of it. We look at it in the starry heavens above and we recognize we're only a part of it and a small, a tiny little part of it at the same time. It's massive. It's extensive beyond our capacity to understand how broad, how wide, how deep it truly is. And within it there are basically three things. There's space and there's time and there's matter. And all scientists who argue for the so-called Big Bang will make one point. And their point is that 14 billion years ago, according to their theory, space and time and matter all began to exist suddenly without explanation. All that exists. That is to say, all of the pre-existent matter that is now what we observe began to exist quite suddenly, quite unexplainably, out of nothing, absolutely nothing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it this way, everything else that you know about has an explanation of its existence. Everything that you know about. Let me take you out in your front yard and look into your, into your driveway. There's an automobile there. How did that car get there? It didn't just pop into existence, did it? There's an explanation for its being there. You say, well, I make a payment on that thing every month. Yeah, but the story goes deeper than that, doesn't it? How did it get there? It got there, well, I pulled it up in the driveway. Well, yes, you did. 
So, in other words, you begin to tell the life history or the life story of that, that contingent thing. Now, the word contingency means that's a thing that did not have to exist. In other words, you bought a Ford, you could have bought a Chevy. You bought a Ford, though. You could have bought a Honda. You could have bought a Nissan. And if there had been now, there is a Nissan there, you could say it could have been a Ford. All of them are contingent, aren't they? They contingently exist because of decisions that you made. But in other words, you'll begin to give me an explanation, won't you? You'll say, I know why it's there. It's because of this. I saw it over, my friend had it, and he was willing to sell it, and I bought it from him. Or I went to the car lot, used car lot, and I bought it there, or I bought it brand new. But you've got an explanation for it, don't you? It contingently exists, and you can explain it on the basis of that contingency. Everything in your experience is contingent, and it exists with an explanation of its existence. If the universe has an explanation for its existence, consider that for a moment. What about the universe at large, the whole thing? All of it, including you and me. Does it have an explanation? The atheistic scientist says no, it has no explanation. It's just here. It's just here by its own necessity. No, that won't do. Everything within the universe has an explanation. So the universe, if it has an explanation, has to be something outside of itself, right? In other words, the car has an explanation outside of and other than itself. The car didn't just appear there. It got there because you drove it there. It got there because you bought it, and then you drove it there. It got there because so-and-so manufacturing company manufactured it, and then you bought it, and then you drove it there. And so everything that you know, everything that you experience, has an explanation for its existence, but the whole of it, everything, has no explanation for its existence. It's a wonder. But the point of it is, if you really begin to deeply analyze and consider and concern yourself with careful answers, you'll know a couple of things. First of all, you'll know that the explanation has to be external to itself. The car didn't put itself in the driveway. And the universe did not bring itself into existence. It had to be something external to the universe. In addition to that, it couldn't be anything other than transcendent, that is, over and above the universe. And it would have to be some sort of personal cause. Because an impersonal cause doesn't cause anything. Nothing is caused that is caused impersonally. Therefore, the explanation of the existence of the universe is an external, transcendent, personal, unembodied mind, and that is God. God is the one who created everything. God is the one who made everything. Now that's the contingency argument, so to speak. Now, think about it a little deeper. God exists by the necessity of his own nature. He cannot have an external cause. Somebody says, what caused God? If something caused God, it would be God, don't you see? It would have to be God. So there has to be someone who is himself uncaused, who caused it all. Well, what caused the universe then must of necessity be greater than the universe, not just other than the universe, can't be a part of the universe, but has to be greater than the universe. Consider, contemplate for a moment, the greatness of the universe. And let me tell you something, there's only one thing greater than the universe, and that's God. That's the concept of God. Just to be able to put into your mind the vastness of the space and the vastness of the material creation that extends far beyond any human eye can see, even with a telescope. 
What caused it all? It must of necessity be of necessity be someone or something that is greater than the universe. Some atheists argue that matter exists by the necessity of its own nature. But matter is not eternal. That's quite simple. And it had a beginning. When you observe within nature itself such laws that are, are basic and essential, the first and second laws of thermo thermodynamics come to mind. That matter, it, when it comes to the energy aspect of it, thermodynamics, that, that on the one hand, there is no loss or gain of energy in the whole history of the universe. That's the first law. There's no loss or gain. That is to say, at the beginning of the universe, there was a certain amount of energy that was present in the universe. And right now, at this moment in time, or a thousand years, or a million years from now, there will still be the same exact amount of energy available. Where did it all come from? But the second law is the most interesting and intriguing one. And that is, over the course of time, and with the usage of energy, energy becomes less and less useful in the creation of heat and light. Therefore, there will come a time, all scientists will tell us this, there will come a time when all heat and light will cease to exist. It will all burn out. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Well, what that means is there had to be a beginning point in all of creation. There had to be a beginning. And that there'll be an end. That it'll all shut down someday. It will all end. So you can see a beginning and an end in just those two simple laws of thermodynamics. And there are many other laws like or akin, and we'll talk about some of those over the time that we have together here going forward. The universe has no explanation. Some atheists, atheists will say that. But it has an explanation. And everything within it has an explanation. And if it does have an explanation, then God exists. Because the only, he's the only explanation for it. There is no other when you begin to think of alternatives, what is the alternative, honestly? What is the alternative? There is no real uh, alternative to that. God exists, and God created it all. That's the contingency argument sort of wrapped up. Now, the cosmological arguments, there are five of them. We're going to talk about those rather quickly. But the point is that the cosmological arguments are really arguments about the cosmos in general. Cosmological just means about the cosmos. What is observable within the cosmos? Well, one thing is what we call the argument from motion. We currently live in a world in which things are in motion. Look around you, things are moving. Here, the, the cars are moving out on the road. Uh, people are running on the side of the road or or people are biking on the side of the road, or, or the wind is blowing and the trees are moving. The point is that everywhere you look, there is movement. Well, movement is a very interesting thing. Movement is caused by movers. That is to say, things that cause motion. For example, you say, well, the, the trees are moving back and forth. Well, what caused the trees to move back and forth? The wind is blowing. What's causing the wind to move? Why are there wind currents? That, and so in, in every one of these instances, you go back, 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 back until you are able to trace in each instance something that caused the movement that you now observe. Every movement that you see has an explanation. Something else caused it to move. And so everything that is moving must have been set in motion 
by something else that is moving. We've all seen, for example, a line of dominoes. And let's just say here in front of us today, we had a line of dominoes. Over here on the left, there's a starting one, and we put a hundred or so lined up one after another until that final one hundredth one. And then we take our finger and we press the first one and make it fall against the next. And so it goes all down through the line until you get to the number 100 and that one also falls. What happened? What happened there? Movement. Who caused the thing to, ha to begin to move? I did. I caused it. I took my finger over here and I, I moved it and caused it, that first one to move. And so number 100 over here fell down because I made number one fall, didn't I? I'm the cause. Begin to look at life that way and you'll begin believing in God. You're going to begin to believe in God. Something and someone must have started the movement in the first place. Who is it that started all that? That's God. Now, understand that someone would say, well, it, it was, it, you, you can go back and go back and go back and back, but you can't go back forever. The point is, infinite regress is impossible. But I want you to know it's the only other alternative to a prime mover. That is to say, someone who is the unmoved mover, himself unmoved, but who began the movements of the universe as it has uh, unwound itself. Infinite regress is impossible. There has to be a starting point. For me, in this particular case, I'm the one who started them falling. But the point is that you can go back and you can go back and you can go back, but you can't go back forever. So who started the whole thing? Who started everything moving? We call that the unmoved first mover. And next is the argument from motion. Stated very succinctly, here's a, here it is. Objects are in motion. Everything in mo motion was put in motion by something else that is in motion. There cannot be an infinite regress of movers. Therefore, there must be a first mover, himself unmoved, and that is God. God is the unmoved first mover who moves everything. So, let's state it a different way. Argument from causation. Some things are caused. Anything that's caused has to be caused by something else. Since nothing causes itself. You didn't cause yourself. I didn't cause myself. Nothing that you know about caused itself. Let's just say you take a table. How did this table get here? I didn't cause it, but somebody did. Somebody caused it to be set here. And I can begin to trace backward and look at causation. And I can say that all these things are causes that brought this thing eventually to be. But there cannot be infinite regress of causes. There has to be a starting point. That's so in everything. Therefore, again, there must have been a first cause, itself uncaused, and that is God. And so we've got the argument from argument from movement or motion at first. And then you've got the argument from causation. Now obviously these are interrelated. Obviously these concepts and these ideas are related to one another. And in a sense someone might say, well they're, they're both the same thing. Well not quite. There may be different ways of saying the same thing. But they're certainly not the same thing. The argument from contingency Philosophy distinguish, distinguishes between it call, what it calls contingent things and essential things. Some things are essential and some things are contingent. For example, uh, I myself, I am contingent upon the fact that my mother and my father met each other. I wouldn't be here if they hadn't met each other. And you wouldn't be here either unless your mother and father met each other, right? So you're a contingent being. The horse that's out in the lot or the, the dog that you own and everything else that you see around you is a, is a contingent being. It might have existed, and in this case it did exist, but it might not have existed, right? Everything might have existed and then might not have existed. 
However, an infinite regress of contingency is impossible. You can't say everything forever has been contingent because all the contingent things that are contingent are contingent on the basis of something that's necessary. Before the contingent, there has to be the necessary. We cannot have a world where everything is contingent because then by definition, it all could easily never have existed at all. And yet here it is. Can't make that argument, can you? Therefore, in the whole of the argument, there has to be at least one essential thing. You make the argument that the whole world and everything in it is contingent. And there's nothing that's necessary. Well, why are we here then? How did we get here? Let me tell you how we got here. We got here because God is the one in necessary, essential being. And he brought it all to be. He's responsible for all contingent beings that exist in the universe. Let's take a break and think about this for a moment. We'd like to bring your attention now to... Uh where we meet, we are at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina, and our regular assembly times are Bible study at 9.30 and our worship at 11, and then Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. And we would certainly enjoy you coming to be with us and invite you to do that. All right, so we're talking about the cosmological arguments for the existence of God. And the third argument is the argument from contingency. And stated very succinctly, here's what it is. There are contingent things, the world is full of them, and contingent things can cause other contingent things to exist. But there cannot be only contingent things. Because that would mean that there is an infinite regress of contingency and a possibility that nothing might have existed, and yet we know everything does exist. And so that's not workable, and it's not logically plausible or feasible. And so an infinite regress of contingency is logically impossible. Therefore, there must be at least one essential or necessary thing, and that thing is God, so God exists. That's the argument. And next we have what we call the argument from degrees. Again, we're talking about cosmological uh, arguments, things that we observe in the cosmos. Properties, every property comes in degrees. Now let me illustrate that from a very simple perspective. Someone can say, that is an ugly car. Or you could say, that car is uglier than that car. Or you could say, that's the most ugly car I've ever seen in my life. So we've got ugly, we've got more ugly, and we've got most ugly, right? And we could say that in just about everything. You could say, that's, that's a, a, a beautiful portrait. Or you would say, that's a very plain looking portrait. Or you could say, that's a terrible portrait. And so there are degrees of everything. And when we talk about degrees of things, we mean degrees related to perfection, right? There must be something then that is perfect against which everything is measured in the universe. Think about it that way. If I say that this is nice and that's not so nice and that's awful, what am I measuring it against? I'm ultimately measuring everything against the pinnacle of whatever it is. And yet, at the same time, I know once again, there is no such thing as, as a, uh, a, uh, an infinite series without a beginning of comparatives. There has to be somewhere a pinnacle of perfection. God is that pinnacle of perfection. We measure everything, in a sense, in our universe against God, who is the pinnacle of perfection. So whether you say, well, this, this is a very strong man, 
Or this man is stronger than that man. Or that man is the strongest man I've ever known. How would you make that comparison except against other men? And ultimately, God is the ultimate pinnacle of strength perfection. And that goes with every other wonderful thing in the universe. That's the argument from degrees. But then, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this in just a moment. And it's what we call the argument from teleology. The universe is fine-tuned for the existence of life. Now that is established by many different scientific observations. The fine-tuning of the universe for life is no longer anything that's arguable. All reputable scientists agree with it. But when you think about it, why is that so? The fine-tuning of the universe, you see, is due to either what we could call physical necessity, or it's due to chance, or it's due to design. And yet we know that there's nothing necessarily uh, in the universe itself, any physical necessity that would bring all that about. And we know that chance is impossible. It's absolutely extraordinary to even think of the notion that chance could explain it all. We've seen the numbers and perhaps you have too. Both those options are implausible. It cannot be by physical necessity and it cannot be by chance. Therefore, there's only one other alternative and that is it's all by design. But don't you see if there's design, there's a designer. Who designed it? What designed it? Why was it designed? Now let's talk for a moment about what we call the ontological argument for the existence of God. Now ontology is the study of the nature of being and the nature of existence. And it's important to study this. You see, some ideas are what we call logically incoherent. And so they could not exist in any possible world. Let's say, for example, a round square. A round square is implausible. That is logically incoherent. A round and a square do not fit one another. They do not work. What about a married bachelor? A married bachelor is an impossibility. It's logically incoherent. It's a concept that does not work. It's not, it did not, does not exist in any possible world that you might imagine. Other ideas do not exist in the actual world, like for example a unicorn. Somebody says, but a unicorn might exist in some possible world. Let's just say my world of fantasy. I live in this world of fantasy, one fellow might say. And in my world of fantasy, Unicorns do exist. Possible, right? So this is, this is the sort of thing that doesn't exist in the real world, the actual world, but they might exist in some possible world. Just read about Harry Potter and all of his wonderful exploits and you'll know what we're talking about. We're talking about possible worlds where things might be. Well, where does the idea of God fit into all of that scenario? Well, the ontological argument states, if God possibly exists, then God actually exists. That's what it says. Anselm of Canterbury, back in the year 1078, posited this concept. And it's been named and has been called all through these years the ontological argument because it's the study of the nature of being and of existence. If God possibly exists, then God actually exists. God is not like a unicorn. God is the idea, don't you see, of a maximally great being, all-powerful, all-knowing, morally perfect, and so on. These are characteristics that we identify with God. 
And if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then we can say that he exists in some possible worlds. If the concept itself is possible, then we could say that it exists, he exists, in some possible worlds. But a maximally great being would not be maximally great, don't you see, if he existed in only some possible worlds. So logically, that would be infeasible, implausible. And that's what we're really arguing, is plausibility and feasibility. And so to be maximally great, he must be so in every possible world that you could imagine. Or else, he is not maximally great in the first place. And so let's just, just summarize this thing. It is possible that a maximally great being exists. That's God. It's possible, is it not? Well, a maximally great being exists in some possible world. But if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then he exists in every possible world because he wouldn't be maximally great if he didn't. And so if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. And so a maximally great being exists in the actual world. And so God exists. A maximally great being, God, exists. It's that simple. Now, Dr. Alvin Plantinga has a variant of this. It's interesting. He put it this way, and he's a very accomplished philosopher, a very, very brilliant man. He said, it is possible, premise one, and this again is the logical way to present it. He said, it is possible under premise one that God exists. This is the only arguable point that we're going to make. The rest are inarguable. They're solid as a rock. They cannot be touched. Is it possible that God exists? Well, Plantinga answers, of course it is possible that he exists. Premise two, if it is possible that God exists, then God exists in some possible worlds. Premise three, if God exists in some possible world, then God exists in all possible worlds. And if God exists in all possible worlds, then God exists in the actual world. And if God exists in the actual world, then God exists, period, end of discussion. That's all there is to it. Let's turn to what is called the argument from cause and effect. If an effect, any effect, is observable, then an adequate and sufficient cause is essential for that effect, whatever it may be. Now, we may not understand the effect or the cause, but we have observed something and we say, I don't know what caused that. For example, you might say that a book fell off the bookcase. What caused it to fall off? And you answer, I don't know. I don't have a clue. I don't know why the thing fell down. Well, there you have an effect and a cause, and you don't understand either one of them, do you? But think about it. We're talking about everything now. We're talking about the cause and effect of the entire universe. Evidence of design exists in great profusion in nature. This is the effect. We observe it. We see it everywhere. You take, for example, just in life, the strands of DNA are ingenious. Just absolutely, the more you study them, the millions of explicit biochemical codes that code for proteins in existence are amazing, absolutely amazing. That's the effect. What is the cause? Well, some people say the cause is accident. Accident on a, an amazing scale. In great profusion. That's a joke, surely. Surely it's a joke. Because we know all about computer code and we know it's never by accident. If it's by accident, it does nothing. It accomplishes nothing. On the other hand, if intelligent beings sit down 
and write code for a computer, then the, confu the computer is able to do amazing things. And that's exactly what happens in nature. And so we're talking about the evidence of design that exists in such great profusion in nature in a thousand different ways. That's the effect. We observe it. Design provides evidence that behind the design there is a designer. So what we do is we infer an essential cause for the effect. Here's the effect. What was the cause? The cause was a designer who wrote the code. And so the conclusion we draw is that God, the designer of the whole universe, must therefore exist. Because after all, he's the only explanation for the effect. He's the only cause, the only possible cause that is really plausible and logical, that he's the only one that works. If you saw something that was amazing, and you looked at it and you said, there it is, who made that? And someone said, oh, nobody made that, it just, it just formed there. You would look at them in this incredulous way, and you would say, what are you saying to me? That's quite impossible. That does not happen. You would know that someone, somewhere, somehow made that thing. If you, if you were to take, for example, a watch, you were walking through a meadow. Think of the, the green, beautiful meadow with its flowers. Everything is quite natural. The world all about you is natural. And you looked down and you saw a rock. You would not pause to think why that's an amazing thing. You would just think that's a part of nature. On the other hand, if you walked on down the lane and you glanced toward the ground and on the ground there was this, this amazing watch lying there and you reached down and you picked it up and you looked at the most amazing piece of mechanical work that was ever put together by man. It was beautiful, it had a glass cover. It had hands that worked together. And you know how they make them today, where you can look inside and see all the mechanical wheels and the, the springs and so forth turning. And this thing was moving actively and it was keeping, and you check the time and it was perfect. You would never say, this is a wholly natural thing. This thing happened all quite by accident. And yet we're told that this is what happens in nature. Everything by chance appearing randomly in great complexity in nature. It will not work, ladies and gentlemen. It just will not work. Such things just do not pop into existence. Someone might say, well, that thing just popped into existence. No one would believe that. No one would ever take that seriously. And yet I'm saying to you today that people do that very thing and take it very seriously. Someone says, it all popped into existence just like this. Or it popped into existence and it developed into that. That's the silliest idea that ever came down the pike. And you know it and so do I. Atheists tell us that a complex, coded universe with a complexity of living things just popped into existence. My question is, here we sit. Why does a horse not appear here in front of me? Why does a car just not pop into existence in front of me? Or a truck, or a watch, or a computer, or some other such thing? Why don't they just pop into existence? We know that they're all made. Everything that I've described, including the horse, is made. Why do only universes appear randomly? Why did just a, a universe randomly appear millennia ago, according to their theory, 14 billion years ago? Why did a universe appear into it? The question is, why here we sit today? Why does not another universe not just randomly appear in front of us here? Why not? So the theory goes. 
If, we're, if universes just randomly appear, then why does not another one appear? And why in human history, as human beings have existed and we have been able to observe, why have we not ever observed another universe that just popped into existence like this one did? Let me make another argument. We call it the argument from the fine tuning of the universe. We mentioned it earlier, and I said I'd come back to it, so here we are. We live in a universe that has at least three things that we'll make observations in regard to that are fine-tuned such as to make it possible for life to exist on Earth today. Gravity, for example. If gra gravity had varied in its power by just one in ten to the 60th power, now that's infinitesimally small. You and I cannot, cannot gauge such numbers. We can't get them into our brain. It's so small, so minute. One in 10 to the 60th power. Life would be impossible upon earth today. One in 10 to the 60th power, if it had just varied that much, up or down or the expansion rate of the universe. If it had varied by one part in 10 to the 120th power. Now, all scientists will tell you that the universe is expanding exponentially. But the expansion rate of the universe is fixed at a certain rate. If it had varied by one part in 10 to the 120th power, life would simply be impossible. That's a very small number. You can't, if you can't get your brain around the first number, you certainly can't get your, number, your, your brain around that number. Well then, let me tell you a better one still. Mass and energy of the early universe, we are told, if it had varied by one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power, life would be impossible on earth today. The universe is fine-tuned. I only gave you three instances. I only gave you three examples in this instance. I'm saying to you that the numbers are astronomically small. You can't understand them, I can't understand them. These are numbers our brains can't even get around. And yet we're told by scientists from their observations that life would not exist if it were not for these variables being in this extremely small area of possibility. If it was off by just a little bit, it would change everything. There would be no life. How is that possible? Again, let's move to another one. A very simple argument from the probability of a single functional protein by chance. People don't really realize how basic proteins are to life, but everything that lives, lives because of proteins. Everything that exists, that is a living thing, exists because of proteins. We're made up of proteins. Well, that means that the things or the stuff of life, if you will, are proteins, all of them. I remember in college class when I was a student many years ago that the professor got up and talked about the primordial soup or the stew in which the first beginnings of life came together. And he talked as if this were a simple thing. Over time, we've become more and more acquainted with the foldings and the, the, how proteins are, are put together. And we have come to understand that proteins, when you begin to unfold them and pull them apart, that they are extremely complex. They're not simple things that just simply came together in a primordial stew. Most proteins, are very complex. They contain 100 
to 150 amino acids. The average is about 300 to 400, however. In other words, if you take a protein and you take it apart, most of them are between 300 and 400 parts that go into this complex thing. Most proteins with say just 150, with 20 possible combinations at each site, translates to one to times 10 to the 195th power. Again, these are numbers we can't get our brains around. That's what the possibilities are. There are only 10 to the 80th power of the elemental par particles in the entire universe, don't you see? 10 to the 16th power seconds since the Big Bang, we're told by scientists. So we're talking about an incredibly impossible event for one protein functionally to come into existence by chance. The odds of a single functional sequence of amino acids in nature are 1 in 10 to the 74th power. Peptide bonds hold those sequences together in proteins. The odds are 1 in 2 in nature so that for a single basic protein uh, it is 1 in 2 to the 150th power for them to bond together appropriately. Proteins require optical isomers to build them. One in two chance of having the proper one is to the 150th power. So the chance of producing a single functional protein in nature by accident is 1 in 10 to the 164th power. All life is built from proteins though. Think of it. Where do proteins come from? Well, they're generated in little factories called ribosomes in the cell. RNA-rich cytoplasmic granules that are found inside the cell manufacture them. They're little factories. What are ribosomes made from? Let me answer it quickly. Proteins. Ribosomes are made from proteins. And yet ribosomes are essential for the manufacture of proteins. How is that? That's what we would call a chicken and egg problem, wouldn't we? Which came first? The protein manufacturing facility, the ribosome? Or is it, is it the protein itself? Chicken and egg problem, isn't it? Which came first? Well, it seems to me that Either one or the other is a possibility, but both cannot be possible. Obviously, we have a problem there, and God is the answer. God is not the God of the gaps. God is the answer to these questions that are unanswerable otherwise. We'll take a break for a moment. The Word and Sword, again, is brought to you by the members of the Newton Church. You can contact us uh, by going on, on email to contact at wordandsword.com. Also, by phone here at the building, 828-465-3009, or by snail mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. And our website, again, is www.wordandsword.com. We're talking now about the existence of God, and in this final 30 minutes, I want to especially center in on what they call the the moral argument for God. Now this implies the existence of a being that is, if you will, the embodiment of the ultimate good, the source of an objective moral value that we encounter in the world. If you think about it, the world either has objective moral values or it does not. Plato argued that things have goodness insofar as they stand in some relation to the good. And he was quite right about that. Christians argue that the ultimate good is God. God is good, and so he is the source of all goodness. That makes perfect sense. When you think about the universe itself, why is anything considered to be good or bad or indifferent? There must be some objective moral value 
that says that this is good or that is, that is bad. If you think about the things that have happened in human experience, for example, genocides, various genocides. Remember that the Nazis committed a genocide against the Jews, but they also did the same with regard to others. They were quite cruel, and they wished to destroy anyone who wore the name Jew. And so six million Jews died. At the same time, we understand seven million Gentiles died under the same hand. So the point was, he didn't just hate Jews, he hated anybody that he disagreed with. And of course, most especially and particularly, he hated Jews. But is that wrong? Is that bad? ISIS recently has been on the outrage. Of course, they seem to be very restricted and limited in their activities recently, but, but in recent years, I mean, over the last few years, we know that they've, they've murdered and annihilated whole communities of Christians and others, Yazidis and others. They hate them. They want them to cease to exist, so they committed uh, acts of genocide. Well, genocide, if you think about it, is very logical makes perfect sense if there's no such thing as moral value if you hate someone if you despise someone who is different than you just kill them that's what they do but if there is moral value if non-personal things have only instrumental value in relation to persons and we realize that's true for example we understand you do I do that a thing like a chair has instrumental view, value. I sit in it. It's good because I sit in it. That is, it has value for me to sit down in it. It has no value other than the instrumental value in relation to me. But all things are like that. If you consider everything in your experience has only what we call instrumental value in relation to persons. How can I use it? How it can, it can it benefit me? How can it help me? But then think about persons around you. Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your friend. Persons have what we call intrinsic value. Why intrinsic value? Because they have meaningful moral value and that requires what we call purpose and will. They have a purpose in your life and they have a part in, in, in your being, so to speak. So they have purpose and they have their own will. They are capable of loving, they're capable of hating, they're capable of speaking and communicating. All of these things give them intrinsic moral value. And so to kill them is something you just don't simply do. It's not just a matter of thou shalt not kill, although we know that that derives from sacred scripture, oh by the way, is found in the Bible. But why ought I not to kill them? Not just because a thing says that in the Bible, and not just because it's against the law. Because in certain instances, don't you see, like with the Nazis, they were the law. They made their own laws. They were capable of making laws that said it was all right for them to do that. But the basis of the moral argument for God's existence is that Non-personal things like chairs have only instrumental value in relation to persons. But only persons have intrinsic value because of their meaningful moral value that requires purpose and will. So in this world, we find a graduation of values. Some things are more good, some things are more true, things are more valuable and more noble and so forth. And such comparative terms, and we talked about this before in another study earlier, but such comparative terms all describe what we would call the varying degrees to which things approach what we would call a superlative or perfect standard. 
a thing is most good, not just good, not just more good, but most good. Something that is most true, not just true or more true, but most true, impeccably true. Not just noble, not just more noble, but most noble. And we can go on and on with that, with all the virtues that you can imagine, that you can describe. Every one of them works in this scenario. Therefore, there must exist somewhere, somehow, something or someone who is in fact the best and the truest and the noblest. Oh, and I can go with those superlatives, right? And so God is that most superlative standard of morality and good. And if that's not true, then people killing each other is fine. And there's nothing wrong with it. And people stealing from each other, especially if they can get away with it, is fine. And there's nothing wrong with it. Men make, make laws, but again, if you can get away with it, who cares? Once again, if you understand that there is a superlative standard of morality and good, then you can say there are such things as objective wrongs, just like there are objective goods. Stated simply, then, it would be this. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. If God does not exist, any objective moral value like love or, or goodness or nobility, you name it, it doesn't exist because God is the superlative of it. Objective moral values, however, and duties do exist. In fact, we all admit it. Even the atheist and the agnostic, he admits, admits that there is such a thing as an objective moral value and an objective moral duty. The Good Samaritan, the story of the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite, remember what they did? They'd walk by on the other side. And then the Good Samaritan stopped and he ministered to the man's needs and he took him to the inn and he took care of him. And as a result, we say that man was objectively, morally good. On the other hand, of the other fellows, we say objectively, morally, they were wrong and they were bad. And it's not just because that's a story in the Bible. We could take a story off the street next week and we would talk about how people passed by on the other side when there was someone hurt and injured in the road who needed their help. Why is objective moral value and objective moral duty something that is requisite in the human life? Because God exists. And only that. That's the only explanation. And so, when you think about it, in looking around yourself, you know the truism that is stated by Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you take the word glory in this case and you replace it with the word perfect, the perfection of God, because effectively that's what he's saying. He's saying that, that no one has ever lived up to that perfection, that divine perfection. So God looks down at his creation and every creature that he sees is not only finite, but quite faulty, quite faulty in need of, of some repair. And so no finite person has ever fully realized all moral value. And that's essentially the statement of Romans chapter 3 and 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if the moral ideal is not realized in this world, it must be realized in that one who is both personal and eternal, and that is God. Now that is the moral argument in its, in its essence. 
What do you mean press on to offer another? This is called the intelligence argument. Sometimes it's called the argument from reason. Human beings have cognitive faculties. They have the ability to think and to reason, to make arguments and to weigh possibilities. Guess what we're doing here today? That's exactly what we're doing. We're making arguments because we have cognitive faculties. We have the ability to think and to reason and to make arguments and to weigh possibilities. Let me put it this way. A dog or a cat, when they're lying down, they may look at you as you pass by, but I can tell you this. They are not con contemplating the reason for their existence. I can tell you this. Because they do not have such cognitive faculties which are the expression of the creation of God, made in God's image, the ability to think and to reason, they're not thinking, does God exist or does God not exist? They're not thinking that because they're not thinking at all. The human brain is different, however, from the human mind. The brain matter that comprises what's inside your skull cap is simply a gray jelly. The mind, however, is beyond that. It's much more than that. Brain matter be, can be weighed and measured, but the mind cannot be. I can tell you exactly what a human brain weighs if I could place it on a balance scale. But the mind cannot be thus measured. Why not? You see, if the mind is just the same as the brain, why can't I measure it? Why can't I tell you how much it weighs? The human mind, don't you see, is the most incomprehensible thing in the universe. Think about that for a moment. The human brain is the most incomprehensible thing in the universe. And so to deny God as the creator of human intelligence, and so intelligence itself, is to, in its essence, deny the faculty of reason. Truth claims cannot be depended upon if there's no so true source of truth. Think of it this way. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father except by me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The truth Truth, don't you see, is an objective reality. We can measure it against its possibilities. Is this right or is that right? If I were to say to you, I know who killed Abraham Lincoln, and the guy's name was John Smith. Well, you would say, you're beside yourself. You're insane. John Smith had nothing to do with the murder of Abraham Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth did that. And you would be right. Why is that? Because truth is objective. If it's really truth, then we objectively can analyze it and see whether it's right or not. And so to, de to deny that God is the creator of intelligence is in essence to deny the faculty of reason. And so truth can't, claims really cannot be ever depended upon because there is no objective source for all truth Ultimately, that's the problem. So according to the naturalist, evolution by random mutations form the brain. So it is the sum total of the biochemical reactions that incur, occur inside of the skull that comprise the human mind. But therein lies a quandary. For the naturalist, don't you see, who believes that there is only the material world, the mind creates a problem from the beginning because it in and of itself is an immaterial reality, isn't it? In a world that's made up of space and time and matter, which is it? You can produce a brain, a, a material in, an entity that you can weigh, but you cannot produce a mind from all of that. Memories and recollections and emotions and relationships, the capacity to think and to reason, can only be explained by God's creative gift to humans. The Bible says God created man in his own image. 
Genesis 1, verse 27, in his image God created us. Related to that, associated very intimately with it, is the argument from consciousness. The argument from consciousness. Think of it. We just talked about a human mind and its capacity to think. But to be conscious, to be conscious, to be aware of and to be responsive to our environment is a magnificent gift that the human being possesses based upon God's gift at creation that we just talked about. If the mind is not built by smaller parts into a larger brain and is fundamental to its very existence, then it must come from a personal source who himself has consciousness, who himself has intelligence, who himself can think and reason, then it must come from that personal source which produces other persons. If you think about all the persons that you know, they came from other persons, didn't they? They came from mama and from daddy, and mama and daddy are both persons. And so the following summary of what we sometimes call the cosmic conscious argument, here it is. Premise one, contingent minds either have a personal exploration, uh, explanation or they have a natural one. Again, using the word contingent, a mind that could have existed and maybe didn't, uh, or maybe could not have existed, but it does. So it's a contingent mind. And it either has a personal exploration, explanation or it has a natural one. Uh, premise two, quantum mechanics, and that's a field in and of itself, and other fields associated with of science imply the natural universe is emergent from consciousness. This is interesting. Science itself is proving that it's all very logical. Quantum mechanics is a part of establishing that notion. And so conclusion number one would be this. The natural universe cannot be the explanation of contingent minds. That is to say the natural universe itself cannot be the explanation. You don't put together a group of accidents and come up with a conscious being. Premise three, the explanation of the existence of conscious minds is personal. Every conscious mind that you have ever come into contact with came from other con uh, personal beings, other conscious minds. So premise four, this personal source who is ultimately the one responsible for all of these other conscious minds is God. We call him God. Conclusion two then is God exists. Since he has to be the explanation for all these contingent conscious minds that exist in the universe and that we know so much about. Let me quote David Chalmers, the philosopher and the cognitive scientist. Here's a quote from his book. He says, conscious experience is at once the most familiar thing in the world, and yet it's the most mysterious. There is nothing that we know about more directly than consciousness, but it is far from clear how to reconcile it with everything else that we know. Why does it exist? What does it do? How could it possibly arise from lumpy gray matter? Good question, I would say. Thomas Nagel, who is himself an atheist and a naturalistic philosopher, when he began to think about consciousness, here's what he wrote. He said, so long as the mental is irreducible to the physical, the appearance of conscious physical organisms is left unexplained by a naturalistic account of the familiar type. In other words, by materialistic evolution. On a purely materialistic understanding of biology, consciousness would have to be regarded 
as a tremendous and inexplicable extra brute fact about the world. He's just recognizing the facts as what they are. Well, then some people would argue the case that the evidence from science is clearly against the belief in God. I've heard people argue that way. But in fact, over the last 50 years, all that has changed. In fact, it's very impressive what has been gleaned from scientific discovery over the last 50 years or so. Dr. Stephen C. Meyer alleges that in the last 50 years, we have produced four, count them, four major discoveries that have taken science back to what we sometimes describe as the God hypothesis. What does that mean? Well, number one, the universe had a beginning. Hubble in his red shift recognition and understanding, that is, he understood the expansion of the universe and compared that with Einstein's theory of relativity, which positive uh, apposited the expansion and deceleration of the universe, prove that the universe had a beginning. These are scientific observations. No longer do we argue with them about that. Space and time also had a beginning. They tell us today it's the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, but the point is they agree there was a beginning. That's a very important step to take. And then third, the laws and constants of the universe that have been so finely tuned to permit life. We've talked about that. That's an evidence for the existence of God. And then fourthly, the genetic code that is embedded in every cell. Three billion characters of information in every DNA molecule which communicates in a four base code. It's an amazing reality. Do you know that a computer is only made with a two-base code? Ones and zeros? Here we have four different biochemical amino acids that are at the base and at the root of this. It's an amazing phenomenon. Fred Burnham, the physicist, said, the God hypothesis is now more persuasive and predictable as a hypothesis than at any time in the last 100 years. Fred Hoyle, a physicist, said a common sense interpretation of the evidence suggests a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics and the chemistry as well as the biology to make life possible. That sounds like he just made an argument for God, doesn't it? Alan Sandage, the astronomer, said, here is evidence for what can only be described as a supernatural event. There is no way that this could have been predicted within the realm of physics as we know it. Robert Jastrow, the astronomer, said, this is an exceedingly strange development unexpected by all except the theologians. He said, they have always accepted the word of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. It is an unexpected thing because science has had such extraordinary success in tracing the chain of cause and effect backward in time. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted there by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries in his book, God and the Astronomers. Well, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? The fact that evil exists in the world, it does. But it's not a major problem for us. We recognize that God has reasons for many things for which we don't have an explanation. And so those who say, point at us and say, well, God, he, he sits by and he doesn't do anything when these tragic, terrible things happen. But the fact of the matter is, 
that we believe and we live through many tragic things and we realize it's all just a point in time, a tiny little instant in God's eternity. And the one who suffers in this world like the early Christians did in the book of Revelation have an eternity stretching out before them, incomparable in its wonder. Thank you for listening today.